Greetings. My name is John Velez. I am the pastor at the First Congregational Church in Middletown, New York. And we want to welcome you to our YouTube video for the weekend. I want to thank you for being here, for watching the videos. I hope you're enjoying them. And if you like them, there's a, a little spot underneath there where you can click the like button so that'd be nice if you click the like button and if you'd like to receive these uh, directly to your computer tablet or smartphone whatever it might be simply also click on the little bell at the bottom and you'll receive a notification as soon as it is uploaded now, I'm trying to do these twice a week for uh, for you and Again, it's a pleasure to be with you, and we look forward to uh, seeing you uh, once again. I want to I wanna just say again, I'm looking forward to the day when we can again assemble in our church, in our sanctuary, and uh, actually look at each other face to face and be with one another. We're dealing with this coronavirus isolation uh, situation, and that's what we have to deal with now most churches are doing this kind of a, uh, a messaging format whether it's by video or live streaming but that's what we're uh, forced to at this point anyway i'm certain that we'll be getting together soon and i look forward to that day uh, laura and i both miss you very much uh, laura sends her greetings she says hi and uh, we both love you and we're looking forward again to being with you this is a trying time that we find ourselves in, an unusual time. This is something that is going on worldwide and is affecting every single one of us. So, again, we just pray that uh, these videos are a blessing to you. That's uh, what they're intended to do. Their function is to encourage you to uh, be steadfast in the Lord, encourage you to read your Bible and stay in your Bible, to pray and to help those who are in need. So uh, with that uh, said, let me uh, open in a word of prayer and then we will look into God's word as we seek his Holy Spirit to, uh, to minister to each of our hearts. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this time when we can uh, come together in this format, Lord, and uh, worship you, look to you. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the fact that you have called us to yourself and that you are ministering to us in many different ways thank you father for your love lord jesus for your sacrifice and for the fact that it is through you and only through you that we can have this relationship um, we we come to you and we trust in you and we uh, certainly ask for forgiveness for our sins and we uh, ask you to just fill us with your holy spirit as we look to you uh, today Thank you for your blessings, and we look forward uh, to this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This, uh, this time I'd like to consider the book of James. We're going to look at the book of James, and we're going to uncover a few of the gems that we find in God's Word. God's Word is filled with just tremendous, tremendous truths for our hearts, for our spirits. And um, I, I tell you, I love God's Word, and... and all of God's children do love his word. So I am encouraging to continue to read the book of 1 Peter. We're uh, doing a book of the month club type thing. And every month we're turning to another book and reading that whole book throughout the entire month. So for this month of March, it's 1 Peter. We're almost done with the month. And we'll have another uh, book to read for the month of April. But for today, I want to look at uh, James chapter 5. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to James chapter 5. And also, we're going to look at Job. You might want to consider just putting your finger there in, in the book of Job so that you can read along as we um, consider God's Word. Uh, I'm going to be reading to you right from the Bible. I have a screen right behind this camera, and uh, that's where I read God's Word so uh, if you want to follow along, James chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 7 through 11. So James chapter 5, verses 7 through 11. The Apostle James writes, Be patient, 
Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate, and how he is merciful. May God bless the reading of his word. It's interesting, if you look at this paragraph, you'll see that uh, James uses the word patience four times. Four times. Be patient, therefore, brothers. Um, being patient. Be patient, establish your hearts. Uh, continue in patience. So there's an emphasis here for patience. And the patience, the, the, uh, the definition that we'll find in our dictionaries is the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. That's the definition of patience. The capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. Well, we certainly are experiencing trouble, are we not? And uh, there's much suffering that is also part of this experience that we find ourselves in with this coronavirus. There's also anxiety, much anxiety. People are upset. Uh, we're, we're thrown into a, a situation of confusion. People don't know what to do. And it is certainly um, ripe ground for uh, a lack of patience and for anxiety. Well, James is writing this specifically to... Uh, Christians that are enduring and going through a lot of suffering and, and trials and testing. As a matter of fact, let me read you James chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. He says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness and that word translated from the Greek is uh, cheerful or hopeful endurance. Cheerful or hopeful endurance. Let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So the reason James is writing this epistle, this letter, is to uh, those who are suffering, those who are experiencing trials of various kinds and testings and sufferings and the purpose of it is so that you might uh, endure so that you might endure through this time and he says to count it all joy uh, this is the christian perspective this is this is how we who know jesus christ as lord and savior uh, can look at things we can count everything joy the Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians, Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. God calls us to a life filled with joy. Not necessarily a life without trials. Not necessarily a life without testing. But in the middle of those things, we can be joyful. Why? How, is, how can one be joyful? in a situation that is trying, in a situation that is testing, in a situation that calls for endurance, we can be joyful because we know who holds our future. We know who's in control. I've said this before in the previous videos. God is in control. Our God is in control. He has never lost control. He is not out of control. He has always been in control. Our God is in control. Your Father and my Father, your Lord and my Lord are in control. And so we know that anything that passes our lives or comes into our lives or we go through in our lives, we know all of it has been ordained by God. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes it's very hard. 
and you might be experiencing anxiety and hardship right now. Well, this letter was written for you. That's why James wrote this book. As a matter of fact, ladies and gentlemen, I think right now I will choose the book of James for the book of the month for April. How's that? Good book. The book of James, that'll be our book of the month for April, okay? So that's why he writes this book. He's writing it for those who, who uh, are experiencing these difficulties, these trials, these testings. Whatever the reason for them, he's writing to them this, this, this letter filled with hope. And so I would encourage you to read it. Anyway, you might be experiencing a lack of patience. Yeah, it's not easy. I mean, you know, you go into some of these stores today and... and uh, we have a shop right in an Acme down the road from where we live, and there are lines of people. It's, uh, that's the way it is. And so you might have to uh, be patient. Uh, this is not easy what we're going through. It'll be over soon. We pray, and um, our God is in control. We know, uh, but it's not easy. So anyway, James writes this letter, and he, he directs our attention in the letter to Job. It's very interesting. You see here in uh, verse 10, James chapter 5, verse 10, as an example of suffering. Here's an example of somebody who's suffered, a real person, a real man who's experienced suffering. We're going to look at his life in a second. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. Verse 11. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job. You've heard of the steadfastness of Job. We're going to look at that in a second. But he finishes that by saying, And you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Believe it or not, the reason Job went through the testing that he went through, that we're going to look at in a second, was to see that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. God is always compassionate. God is always merciful. So with that, let's take a look at the life of Job. James directs our attention to his life. And so let's recall the life of Job and what he went through. First of all, we see in Job chapter 1, verse 1 who this man is. The word of God says there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. This is the character of Job. Job is one who is blameless. He fears God and he turns away from evil constantly. That's his life. That's how he lives. That's how he has lived. So we look at this man, Job, and, and the Word of God says that he's blameless and upright. He's blameless and upright because he's trusted in God. You see, God is the one that forgives our sins. God is the one who justifies us. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ and the justification that's found in him, one who trusts in him as Lord and Savior is justified before God. God says, God tells us in his word, our sins are as far as the east is from the west. Why? Because we have been justified. Our debt has been paid. The blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed us from all sins. If you've trusted in him, you are blameless. That doesn't mean that we're perfect. We're not. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. I don't know anybody who's perfect. But we're blameless before God because we've been justified by the blood of the Lamb. We've been cleansed and made right with God. And so here's a man, Job, who's blameless and upright. He fears God. And that might be a word that we don't use these days, but you know what? It might be a good word to consider. The fear of God. God is real. My friend, if you don't believe in God or if you don't know God, God is very real. He feared God, and because he feared God and he knew God to be a holy God, he was constantly turning away from evil. So, what happens in his life? One day, Satan comes before God and 
God asks him what he's been up to. Although God already knew what he's been up to, but Satan tells God that he's been hanging around on the earth. He's going from one country to another, west coast to the east coast, uh, stopping by wherever he chooses to stop by. So he's been hanging around earth. So God asks Satan if he's checked out his servant Job. He's blameless. He's upright. Constantly turning away from evil and from Satan's goodies and Satan's tricks and his lies and his deceptions. A man who turns away from evil. So Satan retorts back, Of course Job worships and honors and loves you, God, because you've blessed his life with productivity and possessions. You bring hardship and take away all his stuff and he'll curse you. So God says, Okay, take away everything he has. Just don't take his life. So Satan goes about and he takes away all that he has, all of his livestock. He had 7,000 sheep. He had 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, and 500 female donkeys. Now, you might not be into sheep or camels or oxen or donkeys, but that's what they were into back then. What it means is that Job was incredibly wealthy. He was super rich. Matter of fact, you might say that he was like uh, uh, Jeff Bezos or, or Bill Gates. Very, very rich. In verse 3, we're told, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. This guy was big. That's who Job was. So, all of this happens. His sheep are gone, his camels are gone, his oxen are gone, his female donkeys are gone. And notice Job's reaction. Job chapter 1, verse 20. Job arose, he tore his robe, he shaved his head, and he fell on the ground. He is absolutely hurting. This man has had all of his possessions taken away, wiped out. Bank accounts all gone. So, he tears his robe, he shaves his head, he falls on the ground. What does he do while he's on the ground? Look at it, Job 120. He worshipped. He worshipped and he came before God, acknowledging God and God's hand in all of this. And he said, verse 21, Job 121, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. This is this man's response and reaction to tragedy. Incredible. He's lost all of his wealth, but knowing that it all came from God, realizing that God is in control, realizing that God has allowed this to happen, this man worships God. And his attitude is, I didn't have anything when I came into this world. I don't have anything when I'm going to leave this world. I can't take it with me. Blessed be the name of, the God, of God. Blessed be his name. And he never said anything wrong about God. That's a man who is suffering, who is experiencing hardship, but who has joy. He has joy. What happens next? Job strikes, Satan rather, strikes Job with these boils and these sores all over his body, from head to toe. Now he's being hit physically with this disease, whatever it might be. Sores or boils, they, they, it's this, the description given in Scripture. So what happens? Notice what happens to Job next, for chapter 2, verse 9. His wife comes to him, and she says to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. Curse God and die. But he said to her, 
You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? That word evil there is really should be translated, shall we not receive adversity, affliction, or trouble? Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive adversity or troubles? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now, he may have thought, but he did not sin with his lips. And God knows what you're going through. God knows what we're all going through during this time. And yes, sometimes we might say, God, why? We might ask questions, and God is perfectly fine with us asking questions. There's no problem with that. We don't know. We don't have the end story. We don't know what's going to be the outcome of the situation. This will end. So Joseph did not sin with his lips. He may have thought some thoughts that might not have been worthy of saying, which is a good thing. We need to sometimes be careful what we say. I know some folks who've got some awfully loose lips. <laughs> loose lips sink ships. Yeah, loose lips sink ships. So he did not sin with his lips, but he might have thought some things that um, would question God. Nevertheless, what finally happens? What finally happens after God, after Satan has taken away all of his possessions, including, I forgot to mention, including his children? He took the lives of his children. Seven sons and three daughters. And with all of this, he says, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Finally, as God speaks to Job in chapters through chapters 38 through 41, and as God reveals himself more fully to Job, and Job comes to a deeper understanding of who God really is and who he himself as a man is, we read these words. John, uh, Job chapter 42, verses 1 through 6. Then Job answered the Lord, and he said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you and make it known to me. I heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job now understands God. Job now sees who God is. And that's something that we must come to grips with. We must understand that God is God. He spoke this world into creation, and He can unspeak it out of creation. God does what He chooses to do, and He allows things to happen. And God uses pain and suffering and tragedy in our lives, in the world, and has purposes for those things. I know that right now, as the world is going through this horrific situation, there are people who are coming to Christ and turning to Him as Lord and Savior. Why? Because they've been confronted with the reality that death, death, yes, death, can be a breath away. And they're turning to Christ and finding God, being born again of the Spirit of God, because they've been faced with the reality of mortality. God allows these things, my brothers and sisters. These things are real. And yet, Job found out, as he went through the suffering that he went through, who God is. The nature and character of God. God is almighty. God is all-powerful. That is our God. That is your Father and my Father. And my friend, He loves you. 
His desire is to protect you. Let me read further. Job repents, and what happens? God blesses him. Job 42, verse 10. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. What does Job do? Job is praying for his friends now. Now that he understands God, now that he sees God and realizes who this God is, he's praying for his friends. He's not praying that his riches be restored. He's praying for the benefit of his friends. He wants his friends to come and understand who this God is. He wants his friends to come and repent before this God so that they might be blessed too. But he's not praying for his possessions to be restored. But God restores them anyway because he sees Job praying. And he restores them twofold. So we see the heart of this man, Job. We see that he feared God, that he turned away from evil, that he was a humble man, and he trusted in God. Verse 12, 42-12, And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more, more than his beginning. Remember, he lost 7,000 sheep, and 3,000 camels, and 500 oxen, and 500 female donkeys? Well, it says here in verse 12, he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. God doubled his blessing on this man. So he was twice Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates or any of those guys. That's what God does. God allows us to go through sufferings and to go through trials so that we might be molded into the image of Christ, that we might become men and women like Job who fear God, who turn away from evil, who trust in God because God is good. God is good all the time. And even if he doesn't double or triple our possessions, he knows what's right for you and for me. And he'll take care of you. Not only did he double his possessions, verse 13, he also had seven sons and three daughters. God restored his children back to him. Seven sons, more sons, and three more daughters. He blessed him in every way. Verse 15 says, and in all the land there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters. Job's daughters were the most beautiful women in all the land. I don't know if that's a blessing. Um, I'll leave that up to you and Job. He blessed them with beautiful daughters. And their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. And after this, Job lived 140 years. And saw his sons and his sons' sons Four generations, and Job died an old man full of days. What a story. Job's life is a testimony to who God is, and a testimony to patience. Remember James chapter 5, verse 11. Patience. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness or cheerful, helpful endurance of Job. And you've seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. My brother, my friend, my sister, God is compassionate and God is merciful. God is filled with mercy and he loves to be merciful. Hebrews 4.16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What is the writer of Hebrews suggesting? The writer of Hebrews suggesting, brothers, sisters, friend, pray. Pray. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Pray. Come before God. He'll hear your prayer. 
He hears your prayer, my friend. When you and I come to the throne of grace, be confident, knowing that God hears our prayers and that God wishes to be merciful. He will protect you. He loves you. He cares for you. He's watching over you. He's never left you. He never will, nor will He ever forsake you. You're His child. If you've trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior, you belong to Him. He's purchased you with His blood. He wishes to be merciful and compassionate. That's His desire. That's His desire for you. So, pray. Pray. Question. Why should we be patient? Why should we be patient? Well, we know that God is going to bless us. We know that we will grow through with the endurance and the trials and testings. We'll become more like Christ. But there's another reason why we should pray. And we read it in James chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. James 5, 7 and 8. Be patient, therefore, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. Why should we be patient? Because Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming again. Verse 8. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Jesus is coming again. James wrote this to those at that time, telling them that the Lord, the coming of the Lord is at hand. That means that it is imminent. If it was imminent then, it is even more imminent now. My friend, Jesus is coming again. We're experiencing the signs of the times, and all of these signs are growing. We're seeing more and more signs of the times. I'm not going to go into a prophetical dissertation at this point, but you know what's been happening in our lifetimes. The signs of the times point more and more to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is coming again. And so James says, be patient. Hang in there. Be joyful, because Jesus is coming again. One of the greatest scriptures in the book of, in, in the Bible is 1 Thessalonians, where Paul talks about the coming of the Lord. Jesus is coming again. The coming of the Lord is at hand. Be patient, brothers and sisters, when you endure these trials and these testings and these suffering, because Jesus is coming again, as a matter of fact, his coming is at hand. I want to read you this portion of scripture. Understand and realize again, as many of you know, in the Greek there is no there there are no chapters, there are no commas, there are it 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 just goes and the thoughts are expressed. This portion of scripture, 1 Thessalonians 4, from verses 13 through chapter 5, verse 11, is one continual thought. So if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm going to read to you from verse 13 through 511. Follow along with me. This is the Apostle Paul writing. Understand, James has already said, the coming of the Lord is at hand, it is imminent. Paul writes, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep. When he uses the word asleep, he's talking about Christians, those who have passed in the, in the, in the thinking of the, uh, and, uh, of the ancient times, when someone who had trusted in God passed away, they're falling asleep. It was, a, it was considered a rest, knowing that on the other side of that transition, they would be in another realm, the presence of God. So they use the word asleep in that sense. 
For those who are unbelievers, the word death and dead are used. Death and dead mean separation from God. So Paul is writing this to Christians. And he says to them, I don't want you to be informed about those who have fallen asleep, those who've passed, that you may not grieve as others grieve, who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died, you see, when Jesus died, he experienced separation from God. That's why that word is used there, died. Not we believe that Jesus fell asleep. Jesus died, and he experienced that separation from God. And he rose again. Even so, through Jesus, God will bring those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. There was a rumor going on, going around, that the Lord had already come. And many were concerned about those who had passed, who were believers before them. And so the issue was raised in the church. And Paul is assuring them that those who have fallen asleep will not precede those who were alive. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of a command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Those who have passed in Christ, notice the, uh, the stipulation in Christ, will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. You have the picture? Those who have passed away in Christ, they will rise from the dead first, and then we who are alive will be caught up together with them, together, and meet the Lord in the air, in the clouds. And so we will always be with the Lord. Paul says, Therefore encourage one another with these words. Verse 5, chapter 5, verse 1. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you who have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. You see, this will happen like a thief in the night for those who are not aware. Unbelievers don't know any of this, are not aware of any of this. While people are saying there's peace and security, everything's okay, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, you and me, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief. It's not going to surprise us like a thief in the night. For you are all children of light. Children of the day, we are not of the night or of the darkness. Verse 6, 5, 6. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for the helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. I want to highlight one phrase here. Verse 9, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain, obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in a pre-millennial rapture of the church. There are those who do not believe that, and that's okay. But I see here 
the phrase by the Apostle Paul in the Word of God, God has not destined us for wrath. That is what's coming upon the earth that will take those by surprise because he will come as a thief in the night. They're not aware. They do not know. And so God has not destined us, that is the church, that is those that Paul is writing to here, brothers and sisters, when the coming of the Lord occurs, we will not precede those who have fallen asleep, but we will meet together with them in the clouds, and so will we ever be with the Lord. I'm looking forward to that day. Understand, the coming of the Lord is at hand. The coming of Jesus Christ can happen at any moment. And so that's a hope that we have. We don't know when. Remember, Job was a man who feared God and turned away from evil. I pray that you are prepared for this coming which will happen at any time. It is imminent. It was imminent for them, and it is even more imminent for us. So if you have that hope, if you have that hope in Jesus Christ, James says, establish your heart. Establish your heart. The word there, establish, means to, to turn resolutely, to set fast. That's like when you're, when you're, uh, digging a, a post hole in the front of your yard to put a mailbox on a on a four by four post, and you dig down and you pour concrete, and then you put the post in. Set fast. That's the picture. Establish your heart. Have it set fast, knowing, knowing who this God is that you've trusted in, knowing that the coming of the Lord is at hand, knowing that it can happen at any moment. And if it doesn't, we endure and we hold steadfastly because we know, we know in whom we have believed and He is worthy of our trust. Looking, always looking toward the Lord his approaching is near. That steadfastness, a cheerful, hopeful endurance. Brothers and sisters, my friend, we will make it through this coronavirus. This will pass. We don't know what else to expect. We don't know the future. But we know the God who's in charge of the future. He knows everything. He knows all about our lives. He knows all about you. He cares for you. He loves you. He wants you to be strong, to be steadfast. Like that four by four post in the concrete. Once that concrete dries, that post doesn't move. Be steadfast. Be strong in the Lord because His coming is at hand. He will see you through this time, guaranteed. Nothing to be anxious about, nothing to worry about, only a cheerful and hopeful endurance as we stay together, as we love each other, as we help those who are in need right now. So turn to Jesus Christ. He is the Savior. He is our fortress. He is our refuge. And He loves you. Trust Him. Trust Him. Trust in Jesus. He loves you. The Father in heaven, you are a wonderful God. You are a compassionate God. You are filled with mercy. And you love us very much. How we're thankful for this time, which gives us an opportunity to trust you even further, which gives us an opportunity to get stronger in our faith. Father, keep us in your word. Keep us in prayer. 
keep us in union with each other by whatever means possible at this point. But we look forward to the day when we can meet again in the sanctuary, in your house, and sing your praises for your compassionate and your steadfastness in bringing us through another trial. Father, we love you, and I pray for anyone, Father, right now who's listening to this message that does not know you, who has not trusted in you, Lord Jesus Christ, that they would turn to you, that they would get on their knees, that they would ask for forgiveness from sin, and that they would ask you to save them and be their Savior and Lord. And Lord Jesus, that you would give them that full assurance through your Holy Spirit that they belong to you because you've purchased them and paid the price for their sin. And that they are now a child of God who can live for you and know, know the joy and the happiness that comes from trusting in you. I pray for them, Father, now that they would turn to you. And for those who know you, Lord, strengthen us in our faith. Strengthen us in our knowledge of you. Strengthen us in our love for you and for one another. As we endure this time and look forward to the day of your coming, which is at hand. We praise you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, God bless you. I pray that we'll see you soon. Until that time, stay in the word, stay strong in prayer, and help one another. May God richly bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.